So once again, we're here for another edition of the Osteopathic Lyceum podcast. This time, what I want to speak about is inter-rater reliability, inter-examiner reliability, reliability of diagnostic tests. So there's a lot of reliability, reliability, reliability. Right. So first, I want to make sure that you understand the term reliability. So very, very broadly speaking, there's the colloquial use or the common use of the term, which means, is it trustworthy? Right. And that transfers over or crosses over quite well with the more technical use of the term. So the more technical use of the term of reliability, especially when looking at diagnosis, is a consistent range of outcomes regardless of where or where something is being done or who it's being done by. So specifically with respect to diagnostics, what you're looking at primarily in the osteopathic realm or the osteopathic world is inter-rater reliability. So does person A, person B, person C, person D, do they all identify the same thing consistently? If they identify different things, then essentially colloquially, this is untrustworthy. This diagnostic method is not necessarily to be trusted. You have a problem with it. Uh, the other thing with respect to diagnostic reliability is the discrimination between something that is and something that isn't, or something that is ideal and something that is not as it should be. In uh, say the terms of testing, testing knowledge, testing performance, the differentiation of the discriminator is whether or not this is acceptable performance or unacceptable performance. So there's the discriminatory factor. Is this what it should be? Is this not what it should be? As well as the consistency. Is the finding consistent? Consistent between people? Consistent with the same person? And there's some interesting stuff that can go on here. So there are some major, major challenges with a lot of tests within hands-on therapeutics partially because of the obscure nature of what we're looking for so one of the problems that hands-on therapeutics likely has this includes osteopathy this includes chiropractic this includes physio uh, therapy this includes massage therapy is that human beings are normally asymmetrical and if you're looking for symmetry and structure there's a lot of obscuring factors. So the, the varying layers of tissue, the location of things, the fact that the bones themselves are commonly asymmetrical in people and then calling that asymmetry, it's like, well, even if you did identify it, no, duh, yeah, bones are asymmetrical from side to side in the same person. Say you took a plastic model or a real bone specimen of a vertebral joint or sorry rather a single vertebrae if you look at the spinous process spinous process regardless of location in the vertebral column probably not straight down the middle there's probably a twist or a turn in it slightly deviating off of midline if you look at the transverse processes they are not symmetrical so that's just one bone that has paired structures that you can very quickly identify as asymmetrical so that's completely common in living people and in the specimens that we collect from them when they're no longer living so Looking for symmetry of structure has an inherent problem that most people are asymmetrical. So no, duh, you will find that. But when you do find that, it's probably not trustworthy anyways because it's underneath a bunch of tissues which will obscure it. There are some bony prominences that are much easier to find in most people, but often they are quite obscure. So we run into some interesting problems. So in order to further this discussion, as I will commonly do as I go through these, especially solo, is I'll share some research that we can lean into to highlight this, to note that it's been this concept or this problem has been observed by others. And then we'll kind of talk about what each of these means to some degree. So I'll share the screen here. Once I find the right screen, there's gonna be a bunch of clutter on it just because of where I had to grab this from. So uh, the first paper that we're going to look at is from, called Reliability of Diagnosis of Somatic Dysfunction Among Osteopathic Physicians and Medical Students. All right, so this is looking at that consistent, consistent level of finding, right? So this is uh, February 2012. Uh, the authors, Katrin Bengard, Richard Bogue, and W. Thomas Crow. So we look down, and this is the abstract, and we'll find a bunch of what we need in the abstract. So please excuse if you are watching this. If you have the visual, it's quite cluttered. So I apologize for that, and it's going to jump around a little bit. But so give us what I need, what we need, and we can move on from 
from this visual fairly quickly. So the abstract says, several studies have assessed inter-examiner correlation of diagnosis of somatic dysfunction. This study looks at the simple task of palpating the anterior superior iliac spine, ASIS, of both a live and a fixed plastic model to determine whether examination results are reliable. Again, just to pull back out of that, are they consistent? Do they Are they consistent within an individual or between individuals? The plastic model allows for accurate understanding of whether or not what the person, what the examiner says is what's actually happening. So that's why that's there. Anyways, to move back into the text, it's expected that osteopathically trained individuals would be able to do this with reasonable accuracy. However, we tested the results of 151 examiners and found low levels of agreement on diagnosis. Furthermore, the fixed models ASIS were set at equal. At most examiners, 89.2% chose either left or right. So the left was high, the right was high, the left was low, the right was low. They made a call so there was something that was objectively level, but these practitioners called it unlevel. Right? Uh, based on these statistically significant results, we can conclude that palpation for symmetry of two pair structures, such as ASIS, is not an accurate way to assess, assess for somatic dysfunction or SD. It is important to have a standardized approach to diagnosis before comparing one ASIS with the other. That, because comparing one ASIS with the other does not seem to be the best way to teach students how to diagnose. So assessing for asymmetry, when there is known symmetry, has people who have been trained in what is believed to be an appropriate way calling something asymmetrical. So you can't trust people to call something symmetrical when it is symmetrical. Now, there's some things about that that I'll talk to a little bit later. So hopefully I remember this. Uh, basically, it's just about my thumb. So it's not going to be extremely visible to anybody who's listening and even how I have this set up uh, visually you won't necessarily be able to see it right away but my thumbs are asymmetrical in how they move therefore if I use my thumbs to landmark it can actually mess with a, a few things and then there's also the the visual angle that you're looking at something from even if you try to come over the midline you're still kind of twisted and torqued so you're going to have some funny angles to look at stuff but anyways we'll move on from that one aside from pointing back to the reality that a known symmetrical structure was called asymmetrical. There is something to be said for the observation that within the osteopathic profession, it is generally believed that the pelvis will, or one side of the pelvis will rotate somewhat independent of the other side around the sacrum or in relation to a relatively still sacrum. And then you're going to have an anterior or posterior nominate. And then there are those that will make the claim that usually the right nominate is anterior and usually the left nominate is posterior. So if you believe that, if you take that information in and you believe it, you tend, you seem to predictably find that regardless of what's present or not. Anyways, to just move on to another one, another research study here, Diagnostic Reliability of Osteopathic Test, a Systematic Review. So in the last podcast, we talked about systematic reviews and what they're doing. So they're first setting a na very narrow framework in their question. They're, ac they're asking a very specific question of existing research. So what they're doing is assessing the quality of what exists, not what could be there, what isn't there, it's what is there. And then they have inclusion exclusion criteria. So if you don't hit the inclusion or exclusion criteria, or sorry, don't hit the inclusion criteria, you're not represented in the data that's that they're assessing. They kick you right out, but they have to set those to meth methodologically do a decent systematic review. So it's quite, it's a narrowing process. It's a very specific thing that they're doing. Uh, this is from March, 2017, and the author is Fabio Basile. Marco Petraca and Roberto Schionti or Schionti. I definitely not an Italian speaker. I believe those are Italian names. I may be nuts, uh, but I'm sure that I messed up on pronunciation there. So please excuse me for that. Now, again, this is quite visually cluttered. So I apologize for those watching. The abstract here, the objective of this systematic review is to identify, evaluate, and synthesize available evidence concerning studies on diagnostic reliability of osteopathic tests. Now, there's a bunch of uh, specific databases that they searched. I don't need to talk about that. Study selection inclusion criteria were journal articles on reliability of osteopathic diagnostic palpatory tests. Studies were excluded if the examiners were not osteopaths or the studies did not examine the reliability of diagnostic methods. So you have to know that there might have been some palpatory studies that didn't look at reliability, that had no reliability measure, so those got kicked out. Data extraction. The included studies were appraised. The three authors using an 11 item scale instrument, uh, Quarrel or Carol, Q A R E L, I don't remember what that stands for, developed, but it was developed to assess the quality of studies 
of diagnostic reliability. So it's probably quality uh, assessment of reliability is probably the QAREL. It's probably what that is. Search strategy identified 159 studies. However, only 17 met the inclusion criteria. Data synthesis the included studies involved a total of 406 patients. So this is a pretty decent size. 64 symptomatic, and two studies used anatomical models. That's a little different. It's not what you're hoping for. 278 examiners were involved. So that's a lot of people which included 73 osteopaths and 205 osteopathic students. That could be a limitation. So the students maybe can be considered not to be as accurate. Maybe they are more accurate. Who knows, right? It's not necessarily looked here, looked at here. The body sites studied were divided between those of the pelvis, the lower limbs, the spine, and the cranium. Results of the QAREL checklist indicated that most domains met the criteria for being of high quality, which is nice, right? That's a nice finding that the quality of the studies that they included were decent. Uh, the quality of the review studies was good, while the levels of diagnostic reliability were heterogeneous. Right? So they were cons relatively consistent, I think, is what they're trying to say. Intra-examiner reliability was higher than inter-examiner reliability. So I will. what that says is I am likely to find similar things to what I find. Right, So I will find the same thing in the same person more than once. I will likely find similar things in different people. So I am somewhat reliable with respect to myself, right? I'm internally consistent. Inter-examiner reliability is a measure of, do I find the same thing as another person within the same individual and then with different individuals, right? So intra-examiner reliability seems more consistent. Inter-examiner inter reliability seems less consistent is probably the best way to say that. There were no significant differences in respect Two evaluated osteopathic clinical diagnostic tests and body sites, either in degrees of palpatory pressure nor in examiner's experience. However, proper study designs, consensus training, and standardizing procedures, such as the developing models of models, could be effective in proving the reliability of palpatory tests. So because this is an abstract, it doesn't necessarily tell you what the levels of inter-examiner reliability were, but generally speaking, most of the time that you look at this, inter-examiner reliability within osteopathic studies is on the low end. It is not great. The places that it seems to be very good is pal or rather pain provocation, so tenderness, and it is reasonable or some degree of reasonable with respect to tissue texture changes, but with respect to identifying landmarks, it's not that great. Right, so depending on what they were testing, if they were testing tenderness, this will probably look good. If they're testing tissue texture changes, it would look okay. But if they're testing anything else, it's probably not going to look good. Uh, they do note consensus training and standardizing procedures. So consensus training is essentially teaching multiple people to look for something the same way. So you do, everybody does the same process to find something. And you're more likely to find the same thing when you do that. It's not perfect, but it improves into rate of reliability. And we'll start to look at studies that show that. So this one is the, the title is Inter-Observer Reliability of Osteopathic Palpatory Diagnostic Tests of the Lumbar Spine Improvements from Consensus Training. So this is looking at finding specific landmarks and talking to you about what happens the first time and then what happens when they retest after consensus training. Uh, and this is from Brian Dagenhart, Karen Snyder, Eric Snyder, and Jane C. Johnson. I don't know if Dr. Dagenhart is still at ATSU or the or Andrew Taylor still Andrew Taylor still University. I believe he is. Doctors, doctors Karen and Eric Snyder are still there, and I believe Jane C. Johnson is still there in the research lab. Uh, I have actually very positively had the experience the positive experience of meeting both of the Snyders, and I'm pretty positive that I've met Jane C. Johnson, all of whom are quite nice people. Not that that matters when examining the work that they put out, but I can just say that and maybe it's name dropping, I don't know. Anyways, the abstract uh, context establishing reliable palpatory tests continues to be a critical yet elusive step in osteopathic medical research and evidence-based clinical practice. So they identify the problem, the objective, the authors investigated inter-observer reliability of common osteopathic palpatory tests used to evaluate the lumbar spine. So what they did is they identified tests that seemed to be used by many people. And they're trying to see if they're reliable. So are they? do they provide consistent results uh, depending on who's doing them or independent of who's doing them? is probably a better way to say that. Uh, there were 19, There were 119 subjects were recruited from the faculty, staff, and students of Kirksville 
College of Osteopathic Medicine, KCOM, of ATSU, AT Still, University of Health Sciences, three osteopathic medical examiners, residency trained in neuromusculoskeletal medicine, initially evaluated lumbar segments on subjects from one subgroup in a blinded assessment. The examiners performed palpatory tests of tenderness and tissue texture changes, as well as in three planes, vertebral position asymmetry and motion asymmetry. Kappa statistics were used to evaluate inter-observer reliability. So that's just how they're if you know what a kappa is, um, I believe it's a kappa coefficient. I could be messing that up, but you're going to have a number from, sometimes you get a negative number, but it's going to go from essentially zero to one. One is perfect replication of the same finding every time. You don't, that's often not actually a good thing, especially in say assessment of performance measures. It's actually not necessarily a good thing to see it perfect because it that's, almost not attainable. So the closer it is to one, the more reliable reliable it is, or the, the more these people are finding the same thing, the closer it is to zero, the less they're finding the same thing. Uh, following a period of consensus training, subjects from another subgroup were evaluated in a blinded assessment for those palpatory tests that seemed the most likely to, re to produce reliable findings. Interrobs over reliability was then reevaluated. So in the initial set of observations, they gathered their statistics, and then they made a choice to see which ones were likely to be reliable. So they excluded the other ones, probably just cutting down workload, uh, because your data set becomes very large with that other stuff, and you're not likely to have a finding, so why do it? I would argue that you should do it anyways, because you're reproducing, you're seeing what occurred with consensus training on all of those measures because sometimes you can get a surprise. So I would argue that they should have done it, but they didn't do it and they're providing rationale, which is acceptable. During So as far as results, during the initial evaluation of inter-observer reliability, CAPA ranged from negative 0.02 to 0.34 within the poor to fair reliability range. Consens following consensus training, reliability improved, rising into the moderate range for tissue texture changes, uh, so 0.45, and into the substantial range for tenderness assessments, uh, 0.68. Reliability for positional asymmetry in the transverse plane, 0.34, and rotational asymmetry, 0.20, were improved but remained in the fair range. So as I noted already, tissue texture changes, 0.45. So there's uh, moderate. There are, within the kappa range, you'll find scales that give you uh, poor, fair, moderate, substantial. And I think the top level is excellent, but I may be wrong on that. But you'll get these terms associated with those ranges. So the one that's the most consistent is tenderness, right? So my guess is that the reason that's as consistent as it is, is because there is a response from the patient to tenderness. So if you're testing for tenderness, the patient responds. There is a way that some osteopathic practitioners get taught to look for tenderness where you find uh, an alteration in tissue from the region that you're observing. So you say you're evaluating the anterior compartment of the arm and there's a everything's relatively soft and you find a hard spot, you can assume that the hard, harder spot or the higher tone spot is tender. So you can make that assumption. Maybe you're right, maybe you're wrong. But if you push on it and the patient jumps or the patient says, ouch, then you're more likely to find the same thing, right? especially if you're looking for it the same way. The conclusion, authors concluded consensus training improved inter-observer reliability of common osteopathic palpatory tests of the lumbar spine in two of the four tests were studied tissue texture and and tenderness, acceptable cap values for clinical tests were achieved after consensus training. So what that tells you, so there's two things that we've been told so far. Internal consistency. So one a practitioner compared to themselves will consistently find similar things. So there's a level of reliability there. So the practitioner on their own is going to find similar things. But when you compare them to other practitioners, there's a dissimilarity or a lack of consistency. That's, so that's a problem. So if you do the same thing all the time, you can begin to increase your level of confidence that you're finding what you think you're finding. Your interpretation is worth questioning. What you think it is may be wrong, but you're likely to find similar things if you do the same thing over and over again. If we're looking at multiple people being taught to do things the same way. We can trust them fairly reasonably when they find tenderness and a little bit less reasonably when they're looking at tissue texture changes, but you know, we can trust it a little bit. Everything else, 
eh, not so much, right? Especially within smaller structures. So rotation of a vertebral segment and trend or what the heck do they say? Uh, transverse plane and rotational asymmetry. Yeah, so side bending and rotation, those measures on a lumbar segment, those are small structures that are not going to have a gigantic amount of movement. So what I would say is looking for those things is going to be obscure because they're small and they're hard to, they're hard to be accurate about finding. There's restrictions with respect to how you have the patient positioned, what's the table doing, if they're on their stomach, right? So if the patient isn't prone and you squish the TVP, which you can't even really find unless somebody's missing their erector mass, but you squish where you think the TVP is or even in the laminar groove, or you start to shingle test or whatever test you want to do, you may move a bunch of tissue, you may slide your fingers and the bone may not move. I wouldn't trust that. I would say that very broadly speaking, my, or what I would call a macro motion. So gross motion is likely able to identify smaller pr or problems that are subcomponent pieces of the gross motion. So if you try to twist left versus right and the person goes relatively smoothly to the left and not as smoothly to the right, that's a gross motion that you can probably identify. Now, when you're looking at it from an appropriate angle, you can probably see the area that isn't necessarily going along with the motion. So I'd say a gross motion test is a little bit more likely to allow you to identify an asymmetry as well as where it is more likely to be, but not a, it's still going to have problems with accuracy. But I would argue for gross motion testing, which isn't necessarily what they were doing here. They were doing smaller motion testings of lumbar segments. Anyways, we move to the next uh, article from the same author group, essentially. I think the order has changed, but the title of this one, Maintenance and Improvement of Inter-Observer Reliability of Osteopathic Palpatory Tests Over a Four-Month Period. And yeah, the author order changed a little bit. So Brian Dagenhart, Jane C. Johnson, Karen T. Snyder, Eric J. Snyder. So just this is something that may interest some of you. Author order is usually in order of who contributed the most. And sometimes it's not necessarily who contributed the most. Sometimes it's the primary investigator and then who contributed the most as far as the total workload. Anyways, we look at this one and it's a very similar study to the one we just talked about. A uh, few studies have shown that diagnostic palpation is reliable. No studies have shown that reliability of diagnostic palpatory skills can be maintained and improved over time. One of the ways they know this is they were one of the ones that did the first consistency training or consensus training. The objective to investigate whether reliability of selected palpatory tests used to identify lumbar somatic dysfunction was maintained during a four month period as part of a clinical observational study. So very likely they were able to reproduce what they did the first time and just extend it for a longer period of time. They already had the, they already had the methodology. They just had to do it for longer. Participant, so the methods, participants with low back pain and participants without low back pain recruited from a rural Midwestern community, which is the general Kirksville region, were examined during six separate sessions over a four-month period. During each data collection session, two blinded examiners who had previously completed comprehensive consensus training evaluated a lumbar region with four tests, static segmental, positional asymmetry of the transverse processes in the horizontal plane, tissue texture abnormalities, resistance anterior spring of the spinous process, tenderness induced by pressure on the... Uh, whoop. Oh, I lost it. Pressure on the spinous processes. There we go. Detailed protocols for each test were defined during a previous comprehensive consensus training period and were not revised during the current study. To verify that established inter-observer reliability was maintained throughout the clinical study, quality control sampling was performed on all data. When findings were inconsistent between the two examiners, focused consensus training was performed as a means of recalibration to understand why assessments were inconsistent. Inter-observer reliability for determining the presence or absence of somatic dysfunction was assessed using kappa coefficients. So what you're seeing there is when they saw something that was less reliable than they thought it would be, they would redo the consensus training. Now, because this is the abstract, I can't necessarily tell you when the initial consensus training was done and what the time lapse between the experiment and that initial point was. So I can't necessarily comment on that because I'm using the abstract. Um, fairly standard extension of the previous of the previous experiment. Now they did change some of the tests. They weren't necessarily using rotational uh, asymmetry. They were using anterior spring. So they changed one of the planes. So instead of the transverse plane, now they're in the, uh, 
sagittal plane and then its static asymmetry with respect to the TVPs or uh, with respect to the coronal plane or the frontal plane, depending on, is that what they said? Let me make sure that that's what they said. Horizontal plane. Oh, positional asymmetry of transverse processes in the horizontal plane. That means that that was the rotational test. So it wasn't uh, side bending, it was rotation. So that's, I thought I remembered that incorrectly and I did. So there we go. At least I got to look back at that. With respect to results, the study enrolled 64 participants, 14 to 33 percent. Participants were examined per session. All four tests had acceptable inter-observer reliability reliability by the final data collection session. The test for static segmental visual asymmetry of the transverse process in the horizontal plane had moderate to substantial reliability in all six sessions. Does that mean that they had an accurate reading? Not necessarily. It means they had a consistently agreed upon reading between the two practitioners. So the two practitioners agreed. It doesn't mean that they were correct about the rotational asymmetry. It means that they agreed. But that's actually really good. They got to a much higher level with a static test because they were doing the same thing. Tests for tissue texture abnormalities had moderate reliability in five of the six sessions. So that's relatively similar to the previous one uh, as far as having moderate reliability. Tests for resistance anterior spring and spinous process had moderate reliability in three of the six sessions. So that's not that good. And uh, again, I can't comment on which three, if it was the first three, the last three, the middle three, I can't tell you based because I'm using the abstract. The test for tenderness had substantial to almost perfect reliability for all six sessions. In general, the inter-observer reliability improved over time. Essentially what they're doing is they're showing that if more than one practitioner are consistent in the method that they use for assessment, you will improve their agreement over the time. They are both being consistent in the same way. So you improve their, you improve the reliability of the finding, the trustworthiness of the finding, the consistency of the finding. It doesn't mean the finding is always accurate, but it means that the consistency between people has improved so you can trust it more. So what does all of this mean with respect to how osteopathy is practiced? So first, the observation that osteopathic practitioners are not necessarily consistent with their own assessment method. So one practitioner may be inconsistent with how they assess anything. So practitioner A may assess patient one in one way and assess patient two in another way, even if they have the same presenting issue. And then patient three may be examined a completely different way. So there's a lack of internal consistency there. However, if one practitioner, practitioner A is consistent, they tend to have consistent findings. So if they examine patient one, two, and three the same way, they're likely going to have consistent or reliable findings within themselves. What we have seen, at least with two practitioners who have been trained to look for things the same way, what we notice is that the more they do that, the more they find the same thing or very similar things. There's still variance between them. But the tests that we see the best reliability on or the best consistency on is tenderness because the patient responds. And then at least to some degree, rotational, static rotational asymmetry in the lumbar column. You know, I'm not as jazzed about that as maybe other people are or as positive about that as other people are. What I would say is that they found the same thing. That doesn't mean that they were right. So reliability is not a measure of accuracy. It's a measure of sameness or consistency is a better way to say that. So we know that an individual practitioner, if they, if they are consistent, they have a consistent range of findings. We now know that if two people are consistent with the methods that they're using, that their findings get closer to one another or have more agreement. So what that can help hands-on practitioners have some insight for is to be consistent in your assessment approach as often as you can be. And this informs some of the ways that I attempt to share how to perform assessment methods to practitioners or how to build assessment methods for practitioners. I'm a little bit less concerned about everybody doing the exact same test. I'm more concerned about one individual doing the same test as themselves. If I was worried, if I was really worried about inter-rater reliability, then I would attempt to 
figure out a way to generate a, an assessment that would allow most people to find most things and do it the same way. But people being as variable as they are, practitioners being as variable as they are from one another and patients being as variable as they are, there are going to be times when you won't be able to do your normal assessment. You have to do a different assessment for varying reasons. They're in too much pain to do the test that you want to do. They can't get into that position. They're, they don't have the limb that you often use for the test, whatever it may be. There's a lot of variability in patients. So what I would say is that I'm a little bit more interested in having an individual practitioner have a very consistent assessment method that works for them for whatever set of reasons it works for them. And the ability to build an assessment based on consistent concepts. Uh, so the concepts that I tend to use, if you look at varying other things that I've put out, especially on my YouTube channel, the Osteopathic Lyceum, the same name of this podcast, the concepts that I use is macro identifies micro or large mo motions in the human body are made up of smaller components. So a large motion, if it is not working appropriately, there will be some subcomponent that is not working as it should, and it's usually visible, so you can usually see it. I would say patient active, preferably before patient passive. So if the patient moves themselves, they show you how far they want to move or they're comfortable moving. And they also show you whether or not tissues are relatively intact and motor nerves are working when they move themselves. And then the patient passive testing, be consistent with that, right? Then the final concept or heuristic that I use is be organized. So go through the same set of tests in the same order, because if you're consistent and when something is different, it shows up pretty quickly to you. So that's why I'm a little bit more interested in having a particular practitioner develop a very consistent assessment method and only abandon that when it either it doesn't give them a finding that where the patient reports that there's something going on. So when a patient reports that there's something going on in an area, there's usually something going on in that area, but your test may not be the right one to find it. So be as consistent as you can, right? But if you're, if the tests that you choose to use that work well for you don't find something, now you have to pull on other tests that you maybe don't normally use or give you less information. And that'll probably be discussed as we go through this whole process. And I continue to talk in this format. The other deal is that when you can't do your test, you need to be able to utilize a different test or maybe make one up on the fly that's unique to the patient. So that's why I don't think it's absolutely necessary that everybody tests everything the same way because there will be very good reasons to test things in different way depending on the set of circumstances. So I think the take home from looking at what we've looked at and discussing what we've discussed is that your own individual consistency is extremely important for you to find things because if you do things the same way, when something is out of order, you find it relatively quickly and without a lot of issue. I tend to try to minimize cognitive load. And one of the reasons that that minimizes cognitive load is because there's less things to think about. It's relatively automated and your findings are pretty quick. And I, I tend to focus on large motions as opposed to small motions. Small motions are smaller, so they're harder to identify either from with the palpatory sense or with the visual sense. So there's problems, whereas large motions, it's easier to see when they're either not working well at all or they're not even, they're not symmetrical. The other thing is being organized. Again, that's minimizing cognitive load, right? So internal consistency is extremely important. Consistency between people is very nice when we're trying to agree, but it's not absolutely necessary for clinical practice. It may be very necessary for research purposes so that you can have a more reliable data set. So for research, yeah, we should teach people to look for the same thing the same way. For clinical practice, there are acceptable reasons to have variance in how varying practitioners assess, but the practitioners should be consistent with themselves. So again, hopefully that's some useful insight or useful conversation. Talk to you next time.